Joining us now, MSNBC chief legal correspondent and anchor of The Beat on MSNBC, Ari Melber, and state attorney for Palm Beach County, Florida, Dave Ehrenberg. I'll ask you both the same question. Dave, I'll start with you. Were you surprised at this ruling? I was shocked, Mika. The five justices who granted the stay, they threw sand in the gears of justice and they further delegitimized the Supreme Court in the eyes of so many. You know, Chief Justice Roberts cares deeply about the perception of the high court. He wants people to believe that they are above politics. That's why it's mystifying to me that they put their hands on a hot stove here. Uh, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision was powerful. It was comprehensive. It was convincing. This whole issue of absolute immunity is an easy one. It's a legal layup. It, there's a reason why we left the crown 250 years ago, because we have a president, not a king. So this whole issue is a certain loser for Trump, but he wins by losing, because now it's unlikely that the case will go to trial before the election. Not impossible, just unlikely. And although the Mar-a-Lago documents case, Mika, in my mind as a prosecutor, is the strongest case, Judge Cannon has slow walked it. And the D.C. case had the right judge, an experienced, no-nonsense Judge Chutkin. It was built for speed with only four counts and no other co-defendants, but not even Jack Smith, a prosecutor's prosecutor, can ensure that the rule of law will prevail. And so a lot of the blame here goes to the Supreme Court, Mika, but some of that is also on the shoulders of risk-averse Merrick Garland. So, uh, Ari Melber, do you agree? Were you shocked? And in a way, one of our guests earlier in the show said this sort of gives him immunity in some ways. Yeah, your question and other guests, as you say, have mentioned, the whole thing is whether this is going to be a process that holds Donald Trump accountable. Accountable doesn't mean he has to be convicted, doesn't mean he's guilty. It means a day in court. Uh, and if a jury of his peers acquits him, good for him. That's the system. Uh, or if he's convicted, then the rest of the United States can understand through this process what it means that somebody got caught trying to steal an election and held accountable before the next one. Uh, the Supreme Court's action, in all likelihood, based on what we know about the calendar, uh, prevents that from happening. So you're having a debate about whether there should be a trial, and the Supreme Court mm -hmm. has prevented a trial. That short circuits the debate. Um, I think, to put it in English, the court thinks it's being savvy, that it could ultimately rule against Trump and say, see how even-handed we are. Um, and in a way, that's right. this Supreme Court thinking that the rest of us are stupid, um, that we don't pay attention, that we can't figure it out, that it'll be a legal cloud of smoke. And so I think, in a way, it's very obvious from how the court is acting on this one um, that they're trying to game it. They think they could do the optics, they can do the PR on it, uh, and still claim afterward that even though they prevented a trial, they still support trials. It's double talk. If we get there, we'll see what they yeah. say. Um, but, but I think many might see through it. So it's so interesting. Uh, by the way, we have uh, Jonathan Lemire, Elise Jordan, and Mike Barnacle still with us. And Jonathan, I just, I just think it's, it's so interesting because, for example, I mean, I respect the court, and, and I, I doubt that they will come out. I think they'll come out in Trump's favor with the Colorado case. Who knows? Um, but in this case, it was, is a president immune from having, ordering SEAL Team 6 to take out one of his opponents? I mean, this is, this is not a question that it seems needs a lot of pondering. I don't know if I'm oversimplifying things. Yeah, I mean, the generous approach to this is that they felt like this was a weighty enough matter that they had to weigh in, even if the answer is sort of obvious. But they needed to put the stamp of the highest court on the land on it. But in terms of tactics. We are in a campaign year. Uh, this is going to slow things down. Most legal experts we've had on the show this morning have suggested they don't think that even if the Supreme Court acts with some haste, they hear the oral arguments in April, decision comes, let's say, in June, they don't think it will be feasible to get a trial in place before the election, particularly because Judge Chutkin has promised the Trump side uh, plenty of time uh, to prepare. So, so Mike Barnacle, we, you know, there's been this thought among Democrats that Donald Trump always seems to get away with it. Uh, and this seems to be a piece, a step towards him once again getting away with it. There are four trials. He's facing four trials. At this point, it seems at most one, the New York case, which is the least serious of the cases, can happen this year. It seems like the fate of this election and the fate, potentially, of our democracy is not going to be decided in one of these courtrooms. It's going to be in the campaign trail. There's, I think you're absolutely right about that. And, you know, Ari, off of Jonathan's question that he just posed, 
One of the thoughts that has been rumbling through my diseased mind mm. for the last 24 hours uh, is how did we get here? When you consider over the last eight years the damage that has been done to the true direction of the United States of America is enormous. And yesterday's news day, I would submit, was packed with irony. It begins in the morning with the announcement by Mitch McConnell that he is retiring. Mitch McConnell, who bagged the United States Supreme Court, who fixed the, the Supreme Court, prevented a president of the United States from naming a Supreme Court justice. Mitch McConnell, who with a single wave of his hand could have resulted in getting Donald Trump impeached and thus taken off the board in terms of being still a candidate for president of the United States. And then we have the Supreme Court decision yesterday, and we have the time frame involved. The alleged crime was committed on January 6th, 2021. It took an enormous amount of time for Merrick Garland and the Department of Justice to retain Jack Smith as special prosecutor. Over a year's time was lost between the time of the original crime, the alleged crime, and when the special prosecutor took office. And now we have the Supreme Court trying to come up with an answer. Two months from now, they'll start arguments over it. An answer to something that I wonder has ever been posed before. Does a president of the United States have the right to immunity if he shoots and kills someone on Fifth Avenue. Where are we and where are we going mm -hmm. here? Uh, great questions. Mike, where are we? Uh, we're in a tough spot, uh, not just politically with how you may feel about Trump or any other candidate, uh, but as a, as a republic. I think people can feel that. Some people have thrown up their hands and, and been exhausted by it. Others are, are redoubling their efforts. Where are we? Uh, cheating is effective. That's why a lot of people cheat. Violence is effective. You had an earlier segment about Putin, and we're talking about this right now. Violence can work. It was violence uh, that has now been convicted as sedition that actually delayed the certification uh, of then-president-elect Biden. Uh, January 6th was effective. It wasn't a failed plot. It was a plot that resulted in the certification happening later than the constitutional requirement of the 6th. Uh, it could have been even later than that. There were two bombs placed at both party headquarters that did not go off. Um, the Supreme Court, through McConnell and other means, um, does not reflect anything like uh, a relationship with the people's votes uh, over the years. Uh, and so all of these things have accrued up where cheating and other tactics have been rewarded. Now, whether Donald Trump um, is significantly tied to a deliberate criminal intent on January 6th. It's supposed to be a legal question, by which I mean, uh, I, as Mika said, I don't think it should be resolved by local politicians on the ballot issue. I don't think it should be resolved at the voting booth because many people may cheer on anti-democratic mm -hmm. efforts by their side. We've seen that in America before. It's supposed to be resolved in the courtroom. And now we have the highest court in the land saying, wait, we're gonna get involved to make sure it probably doesn't get resolved in the courtroom. That's why this has that Orwellian, uh, double talk, hypocritical flavor. Um, that's why it's a big problem. Is there a solution to it? Um, not in the short run. I mean, in the long run, we as a country have to look at certain traditions and norms and figure out which ones uh, still work today and which uh, may have been so easily, handily beaten through a kind of a cheating, you know, level of video game play by Trump and others where you say, oh, uh, the founders didn't expect someone quite like this, and they didn't have the rules quite like this, and the Supreme Court uh, seems to think uh, that their press releases, their PR, their sort of effort to say they got involved is more important than actually uh, letting the courts have their say. That's an ironic and deeply hypocritical position if that's where they land. 